You may be seated, church. Um, I brought an item this morning. Um, It's actually a coffee mug. It doesn't have coffee in it, although it should. It's got water, in fact, so. But it's one of my favorite coffee mugs. Uh, Number one, because it was free. I won it in an Instagram giveaway thing. Um, But another one, because it's got one of my favorite quotes uh, from the late R.C. Sproul written on it. Um, And the quote is this, what's wrong with you people? Um, (laughs) I love it. It's great. Uh, In fact, the context of where that came from, and I, I laugh at it, and so do a lot of other people who know and, and are familiar with where it came from, was actually a, a panel uh, that had took place at one of their conferences in which they had a bunch of different really, really smart theologians, way smarter than what I am, uh, and one of those was R.C. Sproul up there. And the question that was asked during this panel that they had submitted was this, since God is slow to anger and patient then why, when man first sinned, was his wrath and punishment so severe and long-lasting? And the response to that included this quote from R.C. Sproul. So you can imagine where it went from there, that he has to say, what's wrong with you people? This morning, we'll see the results of the nations who had rejected God and mocked him with a lack of fear and reverence for his glory, which brought about the promise of righteous judgment. And so this morning, if you would, out of respect for the word of God, stand with me. We're reading from Joel chapter 3, verses 1 through 16. Joel 3 reads this. For behold, in those days and at that time when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem... I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. And I will enter into judgment with them there on behalf of my people and my heritage Israel, because they have scattered them among the nations and have divided up my land and have cast lots for my people and have traded a boy for a prostitute and have sold a girl for wine and have drunk it. What are you to me, O Tyre and Sidon, and all the regions of Philistia, Are you paying me back for something? If you are paying me back, I will return your payment on your own head swiftly and speedily. For you have taken my silver and my gold and have carried my rich treasures into your temples. You have sold the people of Judah and Jerusalem to the Greeks in order to remove them far from their own border. Behold, I will stir them up from the place to which you have sold them and I will return your payment on your own head. I will sell your sons and daughters into the hands of the people of Judah and they will sell them to the Sabaeans to a nation far away for the Lord has spoken. Proclaim this among the nations. Consecrate for war. Stir up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am a warrior. Hasten and come all you surrounding nations and gather yourselves there. Bring down your warriors, O Lord. Let the nations stir themselves up and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Go in, tread, for the winepress is full. The vats overflow, for their evil is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon are darkened. And the stars withdraw their shining. The Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth quake. Father, as we allow this charge and this word to sit heavy on our hearts this morning. God, I pray that it would cause a righteous fear within us. To understand, Lord, the depths of your wrath and your judgment and the punishment that you will bring to your enemies. And God, it is my prayer that we would not be found among their number. But Lord, that we would be like Judah and like the inhabitants of Jerusalem and like all of Israel, your chosen people, protected and exalted above our enemies. 
God, I pray that you would reveal to us this morning a righteous fear and understanding of who you are through this text. Be with us now. We pray these things in your glorious name. Amen. You may be seated. Now we've seen throughout Joel this ongoing message. First it started off with this destruction and this assault that was brought onto the people of Judah for their, their disobedience and for their, their idolatry and everything else that was going on. Their, their departing from the word of the Lord and from his law and his statutes and his command. And God used locusts and then prophesied even future a coming army that would be used to discipline his chosen people. And yet there was still a promise that they would come through that on the other end. And now we reach this point where the judgment is returned and it's back, but now the focus is not on God's people Israel, but rather on all of those who had caused the problems. And this is absolutely mind-blowing to me because you think about it and, and God prophesied and was using this the, the nations, the pagan nations to come in and to destroy and wipe out and make a wasteland of his land and his chosen people. And now God has turned and said, how dare you do this? And you think, wait a minute. But God used them. Absolutely right. But he used them because of their own wickedness. And because of that, the judgment still falls on their head because even in the midst of being used by God, they still reject him. Imagine that. Even while being an instrument for the discipline of his people, those nations continued to reject the very God that was sovereign over them. And they too do not get to escape the judgment. Joel starts off talking about in those times. And you see this, this phrase that's used often uh, in prophecy. And when you see this, it is oftentimes pointing forward to what would be messianic promises. Pointing to the times of the coming Messiah and his spiritual reign that is yet to come. And that's exactly what we see here is this allusion to that point. The final judgment of the nations and all of those that would be outside of the people of God, outside of Christ. And God promises to restore the fortunes of his people. I find this very interesting because that word for fortunes is actually the Hebrew word shevit for captivity. You think that's kind of weird. Why would they translate it as fortunes? Because the way that you would actually woodenly translate that is when, when, it's, when the, the authors write, restore the fortunes, what they're saying is that God is going to bring again the captivity of. But who's he talking to? He's talking about his people, Israel. Which is a very interesting thing to see because what it's basically saying is God is saying, I'm going to take my people from captivity and I'm going to bring them back into captivity. But where's their captivity? It's with God. Which is why when you see the Apostle Paul in the New Testament write that you are no longer slaves to sin, but slaves to righteousness, slaves to Christ, that's the exact point that Joel is making here too. That you have been brought out of the captivity of sin and you have been brought into the captivity of God. And there's no better place to be in prison and be in captivity than with your Lord. So that is God's people will be captives, but this time it's not of the Edomites, it's not of the Philistines or the Assyrians or the Babylonians, but captives of the Most High. Not slaves to their enemies, but slaves to their God. Not to unrighteousness, but to righteousness. God will call his people back despite the dispersion and despite their being scattered Though the land has been divided, God has not renounced his claim on the people or on his land. Joel writes, I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. This is God speaking directly 
The Valley of Jehoshaphat is actually believed to be the location, uh, located at the site of the Kidron Valley is what it's known as today. And that's actually the valley that is east of Jerusalem between the city of Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives, which I don't know if this has any correlation or really any meaning, but it's, it's just interesting to find these things out. But the Mount of Olives is where Jesus went to pray that night before his crucifixion. And so this valley of decision takes place between the city of Jerusalem, the holy city of God, and the place where Jesus poured out his heart and his soul as he prayed before his brutal crucifixion and death. And I don't know if there's correlation to that, but it's an interesting fact to point out nonetheless, because this valley of Jehoshaphat is also called the valley of decision. Jehoshaphat means Yahweh is judge. Yahweh is judge. In fact, there was a king by the name of Jehoshaphat. He was, in fact, the fourth king of Judah, and it was under the the divided monarchy between the the north and the south. And you can read about this in in 1 Kings 22 and in 2 Chronicles 18. And and Jehoshaphat actually started out in his, his kingship doing fairly well. He was not necessarily a bad king king but he didn't stay on that path really because he had this really bad habit of aiding wickedness and so not unlike the constant aid of wickedness done by the nations to all of those that were the 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 surrounding enemies of Israel and the constant attacks and aid that they gave to them the people under Jehoshaphat's reign experienced judgment for their constant return to pagan practices because of who was leading them one who had no problem with joining in and lumping together with wickedness. Now, while King Jehoshaphat was not likely linked to that valley, right? The valley wasn't named after him, but his name nonetheless means Yahweh is judge. What a sober reminder that it is not us, it is not our court systems, it is not our government, it is not our peers, but it is the Lord who will bring judgment in its fullest extent. The focus here and its reasoning becomes the mistreatment of God's people. We see that they have scattered them among the nations. We see that they had sold and traded them. In fact, it says they cast lots for my people. They traded a boy for a prostitute, sold a girl for wine, and and sold the people of Judah. Tyre and Sidon are mentioned here, which are actually known for their active participation in the slave trade. And they were likely the culprits leading the charge in much of this capturing and this trading of the, the, the Israelites as prisoners of war or, or just as, as free game. Their crimes were among the most inhumane dealing in human merchandise. And it grieves my heart to say that that's still not changed even in today's world. That people are still sold and traded for the exact same reasons that Joel is mentioning here. So cheaply valued were his chosen covenant people to the nations that they were sold as prostitutes and they were exchanged for the fleeting pleasure of drunkenness people. One of the worst results of these deportations was the selling, of, the selling off and the trade of children for wicked, sinful lusts and passions. And as I said, it still takes place today. And if that does not grieve your heart, I don't know what will. There was also a mismanagement of God's possessions. As, as, as Joel shares here, they divided up God's land. They've taken his silver and his gold. They carried his rich treasures out and, and placed it in their temples, which we see this happening time and time again with all of the nations throughout the Old Testament. They would come in and they would capture things and they would take the precious silvers and the golds and the treasures that were in the temple of God and they would take it into their own or they would make, make it filthy and, and, and unclean with their practices. I think the worst thing that we end up seeing here is actually the misguided anger 
that's pointed at God. In fact, he asks the question as God is speaking to the prophet Joel, are you paying me back for something? Which is meant to be kind of a rhetorical question that's being asked here. The affront of the nations against the people of God was called into question by him himself as a curiosity if they felt that God had wronged them and needed to be repaid in vengeance. The nations who, who rejected God and who, who praised and, and, and idolized the as other pagan gods and these idols are, are, are saying, well, God, you've, you've wronged us. No one has been wronged by God and to assume that is narcissistic beyond measure. To ever think that you, a creature of the dirt, deserve anything from the Almighty. Imagine the, the pedestal that you would have to put yourself on. There was a misguided anger at God. But we see that God will not be mocked. And a good and a righteous judge will carry out judgment in a good and righteous way. Or else he would not be in line with his character. And if God is not perfectly in line with his character, then he ceases to be God. We cannot pick and choose what we want God to be based on how we feel he should because we're fallen and we're finite and we don't understand. But there are hard, fast truths that we hold to and they can be reconciled then because our God does not exist outside of his characters revealed in scripture. If he is good, then we know he is good. If he is wrathful, then we know he's wrathful. And both of those things, as much as we may want to say, well, you can't have those two, you can. And I'll tell you how, God, he's done it. He knows what that looks like. And he's revealed it in his scripture. He does not deviate from his character. The second thing we can see this morning regarding the judgment of God is its warning. Understand that our God is a good and gracious God and even so, he does not bring this judgment without people actually knowing that it's coming. He's not catching anyone by surprise. Now, they might be caught off guard because they weren't listening, but he has made it very abundantly clear what is expected, not just from his people, but from the, all, all of creation. He says, payment will be returned. I will return payment on your own head. And so now you see this, this flip about what's happening with the, the nations that have oppressed and have come in, uh, not just on Israel, but ultimately, again, this is pointing towards the last days the times of the Messiah when Christ returns in all of his glory to bring this judgment. It says, I will sell your sons and your daughters into the hands of the people of Judah. You think, man, how the tables have been turned now. Because while once the nations were capturing and trading and selling off the children of Israel and of Judah, now it says that your children will be sold into their hand. The very humiliation and atrocities would find their way back onto the heads of the nations. It says they will sell them to the Sabaeans, to a nation that was actually reckoned by the Jews to be to the uttermost. They, the Sabaeans were those that were the farthest reaches that they, they could possibly imagine. And so that's the, the point that's being made here. When God says that they'll be sold to the Sabaeans, he's saying you'll never see them again. It'll be as if that because they will be separated from you in this way. Their very sons and daughters would instead be sold in response and carried away to distant lands. And I can't help but think symbolically of this. The most drastic dispersion that would happen at this coming judgment would be the final eternal separation of those outside of Christ. It's farther than what the Sabaeans are going to sell to. 
It's an eternal separation from God and from all of his righteousness and from the God of all peace. The warning was that payment would be repaid, but not only that, the warning is that the certainty has been declared. The phrase there that's used is this, for the Lord has spoken. That's meant to be a very, very strong phrase that's used. This was a phrase that was used to declare that the Lord had decreed it so it shall pass. There was no question in this judgment. His counsels and his decrees can never be frustrated and they can never be overturned. God is not a man that he can be thwarted or he can be deceived, nor can he be caught off guard, but all things that come to pass have been so determined by God's absolute sovereignty. If he said it, it will happen. There is no question. But God is not unjust to take a cheap swing at his enemies, but he gives them fair warning and he does so even today. In fact, he has chosen to use the church to deliver that warning to those that are far off, that they not, might not experience that separation and that dispersion, that they, not, that they would not be driven far from the presence of God, but they would be brought in near. However, the proclamation is made for all the nations to hear. Consecrate for war. Stir up the mighty men. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Hasten and come, all you surrounding nations, and gather yourselves here. John Gill writes, the decree of God concerning the deliverance of his church and the destruction of their enemies is to be proclaimed among them. To the terror of them, and to the comfort of God's people, encouraging them to battle. This was meant to strike fear into the hearts of the nations and peace into the hearts of God's people. The warning is that judgment would follow. In fact, it says, bring down your warriors, O Lord. This was a, a call then to to. For, for God to bring his army forth for the battle and the fight over his people. There's a few verses that, that talk about this. You go to Zechariah 14.5 and it says, and you shall flee to the valley of my mountains for the valley of the mountains shall reach to Azal and you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with him. Psalm 68 17, the chariots of God are twice 10,000, thousands upon thousands. The Lord is among them. Sinai is now in the sanctuary. There is no doubt of the power of God and his army. It was meant to strike fear into any who would oppose him. In fact, one of my favorite psalms, and we read it this morning uh, on, the, on the way to church in the car, we read Psalm 1 and 2, but in Psalm 2, 1 through 6, it says this, why do the nations rage? and the people's plot in vain. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. But he who sits in the heavens laughs and the Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. The nations plot in vain. They say there is no God, or they mock him with their, their lives and the way that they live, and God sits in the heavens and he laughs. Almost sarcastically as if mankind really has a say in the matter or any way that they could possibly stand up against it. So Joel here issues this bitterly ironic challenge of battle to the nations that the Lord has determined to defeat. Bring out your warriors, not just the mighty men, not just the trained soldiers, but bring out those who are farmers 
Have them grab their sickles and sharpen them into swords. Bring out everyone. You have a a problem with God and you've got a a beef that you want to take up with him. Here's the place. It's the same thing when you've got the the two guys that get in a fight and they're just like, you know what? This time, six o'clock, right out here in the parking lot, right? This is God's call to the nations. You've got a problem with me? That's fine. Here's the valley we'll meet. Bring everyone you got. I'll meet you there. It's like taking a bet that you already know the outcome of, which would be foolish for the person who's on the losing side, but for the one that's on the winning side, you can't help but chuckle knowing it's in the bag. God offers the fair warning. The last thing we see regarding God's judgment is its execution. There is this ironic reversal of the punishment of Judah. He writes, put in the sickle for the harvest is ripe. Talks about the, the grain, the threshing floor and, and, and everything being ripe for, for the taking and, and the, the vats that are overflowing. If you look back, it says like grain ready to, to be cut down and these grapes that are ready to be pressed into wine, so are the nations prepared for destruction, the harvest of judgment. The full wine press and the overflowing vats emphasized earlier in, in uh, chapter 2, the, the prosperity of Judah. That the threshing floors were full and that the, the wine vats were overflowing. It was this idea of prosperity. But here, it's this ironic reversal because when it comes to the nations, it's talking about the wrath and the judgment of God. And so you see this emphasizing of the wickedness of the nations and the promise of judgment that would be in that valley. It's this turn of phrase of the promise that was made to Judah. Judah will prosper, but the nations will fall. Where the threshing floors and wine vats were a symbol of prosperity, here is symbolic of, the, of God's fierce wrath and their fates would be determined in the valley of decision Again, in reference to the valley of Jehoshaphat, I understand when, when you hear this valley of decision, this is not something of, of telling you this is where you make your decision, this is where God has made his. On whom he would bring justice. So its execution would be done ironically, but it would also be done with great fear. You see in verse 15 it says the sun and the moon are darkened and the stars withdraw their shining. Try and picture the terror that would befall you if we all left this morning, walked out into the parking lot and the sun itself just fizzled out to nothing. You would be terrified. Why? Because you've never seen anything like that happen before. I imagine it was frightful for the people who were there at the execution of Jesus. Jesus. Because it said darkness came over the entire land. The sun withdrew its shining. There was no moon or stars to illuminate anything. It was pitch dark at that moment. Which then would make sense then that the response from the Roman centurion was standing there was a shaky and a fearful and puny realization of surely this man was the son of God because they had never seen anything like this in all of their days. Even nature responds to the Lord's power and his appearance in judgment. Verse 16 kind of finishes it out, at least the first half of it. We'll get to the second half of 16 next week, but it says the Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem and the heavens and the earth quake Frank Gabling says because the nations had roared insolently against God's people the Lord would be a lion roaring after its prey in behalf of the returned revenant an encounter with God would provoke one to fear that's true now there's two different kinds of fear you don't really think about that. Oftentimes you hear fear and it's a very negative response. 
I encourage you to, to look up actually the, the study done on, on the fear of God that's done by Michael Reeves um, because it's interesting what you'll find. There are two different kinds of fear when it comes to God. There is a sinful fear as it is the obvious response of the nations here. In this case, sinful fear results in the immediate fleeing from the presence of God. To fear him on a, on a level of, of, of this destruction and this power and this authority that he has and to understand that, that he is a, a very terrifying God to those that are outside of him. But interesting enough, fearing God is not always bad. In fact, Proverbs 9 tells us, Proverbs 9.10 tells us that it is in fact the fear of God that is what? The beginning of wisdom. Now that doesn't sound negative, does it? That sounds like a very positive thing. That sounds like something you would say, yeah, I, I can get behind being fearful of God because I would like wisdom. Righteous fear results in a drawing closer to God. While a sinful, unrighteous fear would result in us fleeing from his presence, a righteous fear brings us near to him, drawing closer to him, because godly fear is nothing other than a love for him. Not a gloomy fear that is marked by anxiety, but a heartfelt and happy enjoyment of him. There are two different types of fears. Which one do you have? Because one brings about enjoyment and the other brings about pure terror. It's kind of the difference between riding on a roller coaster and then the seatbelt coming unlatched and you falling out of that roller coaster mid-loop. Two different types of fear. One is very enjoyable, the other is not. Unless you don't like roller coasters at all, then the whole thing's terrible and fearful for you. But you get what I'm saying. Michael Reeves actually said this in, in one of his, um, in, in part of his study of the fear of God. He said this, a holy God is terrible for those who are far from him. A holy God is terrible for those who are far from him because the only thing that, le- that, that resides and actually remains is this fearful expectation of judgment. But for those that are in Christ and those who are near to him, it's a blissful fear, an awe-inducing fear, a reverent fear that draws us close to him because we truly understand and we know who he is. Those in the loving protection of Christ, there is no need to be paralyzed with terror, but we can respond in a right and reverent fear of the Lord which brings us to the foot of his throne in awe. I want to revisit the original question that was asked by that curious attendee of the panel. Since God is slow to anger and patient, then why, when man first sinned, was his wrath and punishment so severe and long-lasting? And I want to read Sproul's response in its fuller context He said, wait a minute. This creature from the dirt defiled the everlasting holy God. After that, God had said, the day that you shall eat of it, you shall surely die. And instead of dying, Thanatos, on that day, he lived another day. And he was clothed in his nakedness by pure grace and had the consequences of a curse applied for quite some time, but the worst curse would come upon the one who seduced him, whose head would be crushed by the seed of the woman. And the punishment was too severe? What's wrong with you people? He went on to say that this was what was wrong with the Christian church today. He said, we don't know who God is and we don't know who we are. And I'm sad to say that's even, that, that's true for the church. And it's certainly true for the nations. The right question to ask was not why was his punishment so severe, but why wasn't infinitely more? Why didn't Adam and Eve die on that day? 
Why, were, why, why, why was Abraham even called? Why was he not destroyed? Why were the rest of the world, why did God not just wipe out everything in that moment? It's because our God is a God of grace and a God of love. A God who desires to see people changed and to come to him. My challenge for you this week is this, to practice a right fear of God. Some of us maybe have never even considered this or thought about this before. What does it mean to fear God? And I encourage you, look into that this week and practice that. Finding a right fear of your creator. And I know it sounds, as I shared, it sounds weird to think about it that way because like I shouldn't be afraid of God you most certainly should but it's the result of that fear that drives you into his presence even more and so ways that you can do this the very first and foremost one is this by reading and studying his word it seems simplistic well how do I get a right fear of the God know who he is know what he says know his character know the authority that he holds and submit to it. You won't consider that which you don't know. And that is true of God. The next thing you can do is remind yourself of who you are. I go back to, to Sproul's quote that he had there. This creature from the dirt. You're dust. Now there is an extreme end of that. If you want to walk around and just consider yourself nothing but dust and become some kind of monk that like flogs themselves and, and plays that, that pity party and everything, that's great, fantastic, but you're going to be miserable. You need to understand you are dirt and you are dust. But there's another end of that. And if we focus too much, and that's what we end up finding a lot of times, again, I say it every single week I feel like, there's a danger in extremes. If all you ever want to do is consider yourself dirt, but you never want to consider yourself righteous that's found in Christ, then you're missing so much more of the gospel. It was not meant to just bring the condemnation, but it was meant to bring the restoration. So remind yourself of who you are. You aren't God's gift to mankind. You're a creature of the dirt. And yet, even as a creature of the dirt, you are loved and cherished enough by your heavenly Father to be called righteous on account of Christ. You're precious dirt. You're, you're good dirt. Farmers would understand that a lot more and they would get that. You're lovely dirt. And that's a beautiful thing to remember. The last thing you could do to practice a right fear of God is this. It goes back to reading scripture, but this time, do it out loud. Right? You, you often say, well, I, I want to hear God. I want to hear what he says. The best way that you can hear what God says is by reading scripture. And if you want to hear it audibly, read it out loud. It's a good thing to practice. So in your time of study this week, let the sound of the divinely inspired words of the creator himself weigh on you as you read them verbally. And I would encourage you, if, if you don't know where to start, go to Psalm 1 and 2. Because they're two beautiful psalms that really set up the entire rest of the book. And read those. So I want to actually end this morning with reading just the, the end of Psalm 2 because I started off with reading a little bit of the beginning of it. But Psalm 2, verses 11 and 12 says this. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish in the way for his wrath is quickly kindled. 
Blessed are all who take refuge in him. May the fear of God deal with and comfort our anxieties, not cripple us under the weight of judgment reserved for those that are far from him. May the fear of God and his judgment not bring you to despair, but bring you close and near to him this week. Pray with me. Father, God, we are so grateful for your holiness, for your righteousness. Lord, for your faithfulness and your goodness to us. God, I pray that as we seek this week to discover a right fear of you, God, that it would draw us close, that it would draw us near, and that it would bring us ever before you with songs of thanksgiving, with tears of joy, and with praise and worship and adoration of who you are and the justice that you bring and the blessings we receive. God, we love you. We praise you. We thank you. And we pray all these wonderful things in your name. Amen.